Continuing on with the theme of exploring your data, one key element of being able to do this is to visualize it, to plot it. In this chapter, we're going to talk about that in the context of exploring your data. So we're not necessarily going to make plots that are very pretty, but more plots that are functional. In the next chapter, we'll talk about how to make attractive graphs for publication. We'll be using the ggplot2 library for, for almost all of our visualization at the beginning of the class. So make sure that you have that installed and then you can load that with the library call. Once you do, we're going to talk through these ideas of how you build up a graphic with ggplot. It takes a little bit of time to get used to the system, and I think there's a reason behind that. So ggplot was based on some ideas developed by Leland Wilkinson in a book that's been published over 20 years ago now, I think, called The Grammar of Graphics. And the whole idea is that instead of creating these kind of large black box functions to create one visualization, but where the user doesn't have a, a very easy time kind of customizing and creating their own thing, what you can do instead is pinpoint the elements and the rules for how they go together uh, of these different visualizations. And then you can create these small pieces that go very elegantly and easily together. And then the person can really build that up to create almost anything. So we'll look through doing that, but I do want you to be patient with yourself at first because it will take a minute to kind of figure out these ideas and see how the pieces go together. But I promise it's worth it because once you do, the system really lets you customize in any number of ways and, and you become much more of a builder when you're working with it rather than taking something somebody else has imagined and being limited to the visualizations they thought to do. So in this video, we'll be covering a little bit about the basic steps of creating a plot with ggplot2. The first thing that you'll need to do, the first element that goes in is the data. So we'll talk a little bit about that, how you specify the data and how you can kind of pull pieces from the data as you're building your plot. Then we'll have geomes where each has an aesthetic specified, one or more. And then finally, we'll talk about how you can add on these other elements and you can you can have several different geoms there or add things to customize titles and pieces like that. As we do this, you've been starting to work with piping and you've gotten a feel for how you can build on different steps in cleaning your data or exploring your data by piping out and then adding on another function that takes that as an input. ggplot has a pretty similar idea where you're building these layers and again, you're kind of sending what you have so far into the next, the next layer in the next line of code. However, it's important for you to remember that with ggplot, we won't use the pipe symbol at the end. Instead, we'll use a plus sign. So a really similar idea, but the convention for, for the operator that we use is just a little bit different. As a note, to avoid errors, this will definitely happen to you at some point. To avoid errors, make sure when you do those pluses, you do them at the end of, the, of a line instead of at the start of the next line. Because what happens is that R will go through all of those lines for a ggplot, and if it gets to a line that ends without a plus sign, it will think that you're done. And so it'll evaluate all of that and then it won't know what to do with the next line that starts with a plus sign. So the first element that goes into creating a visualization with ggplot is the data. And ggplot is very data frame centric, just like a lot of the rest of the tidyverse where we're keeping our data in that data frame format, um, in that type of object throughout will send it straight into ggplot in the same format. What that means is that a lot of what you have to work with in creating your visualization is the columns of your data frame. So you can see here that we've got these columns for that example Beijing data set that we've been working on in other videos in this lecture. So we can create visualizations that, that illustrate these values across our different observations. For example, we could do a scatter plot where we, on the x-axis, show what the sample time was, and then on the y-axis, what the PM value was. And we could even do something like use color to show what category of AQI that observation was in. This will end up looking like a time series where we're really going, as we go across the x-axis, we're really going across time and seeing how the PM values have changed. So let's take a look at what that looks like. It might look like this. So here again, the X position is showing the value for each of those observations for the, the timestamp for when the data was collected. And again, each of these points, think of these, these are, these are rows in your original data frame. So each row in this case has translated into a point. 
On the y-axis here, I'm showing the value of that value column. So how high the point is here is an indication of how high the measured PM 2.5 was that day. And then the color, the AQI column, is mapping to show what value of the AQI we have. And um, reassuringly, we're seeing these kinds of bands of color as we go across. And that's because if you remember, the AQI categories are done based on splits for PM 2.5. So it makes a lot of sense that we have them in different categories as we move up the y-axis. So that was the first piece of the data. The second piece is the aesthetics. And we already talked about that just a little bit. We talked about that idea in the last plot of how we were matching up the column with the time of the observation with the, the position on the x-axis. And we were matching up the PM 2.5 values, so that value column, with the y-axis, and then matching up the color of the point with the AQI value, the value in that column. So those mappings are something that we do to set the aesthetics of the plot, those different visual elements of the plot. And we map it because the level of each of those aesthetics is being shown by the value in a certain column. So we're mapping that column to that aesthetic. We'll set that up by using these, these, these kinds of um, formal argument values for a number of those different aesthetics. So the x position is referred to as x, so we'll set x equals sample time. The y position is y, so we're going to set that equal to value. And then the color is color, and so we're setting that equal to AQI. This will go in a piece that's an actual little function called AES. I've shown it down here. And in this case, I'm just showing the snippet. We will probably never run this function by itself. It'll always be nested inside another part of the ggplot code. But when we set this up, we'll do these mapping separated by commas within that call. So I'm doing AES here. And again, I've said that X will be the sample time column. So the X aesthetic is mapped to that. Y is value. So the position on the Y axis will be mapped to the, the level of the observation in that value column. And then the color aesthetic is being mapped to AQI, to the AQI column. There are a number of these different aesthetics you can set. Um, some of the common ones include X and Y that we just looked at. Shape, you can have different shapes to your points if you're doing points, for example. You can also change both the color and the fill. In some cases, you won't have a fill. Um, if you're just looking at the default point values, those only have a color. So if you set color, it'll change the whole thing. But there's some things that we'll look at that actually have a border and then an inside as well. We'll see this a whole lot when we start mapping. We'll have like the edges of the state and then the color that's in the inside of that area. In those cases, color will refer to the border of the element and then fill to the inside. You can also set the size of some of your different elements, and you can set transparency with alpha. For this, one means opaque, and zero means completely transparent. But you can pick a value in between to have something that, that's slightly transparent. And that can be really helpful if you're plotting a lot of data, because then you'll be able to see very clearly where there are points that overlap. And then there are also some aesthetics that are very specific to the type of thing you're creating. So for example, if you're creating a, a plot with a line in it, you can use line type to set whether it's a solid or a dash line. So those are the first two elements, the data and the aesthetics. And then the third one is the geoms. These are the actual things that go on the plot. They're the geometric objects that you end up plotting. There are a number of geom functions that you can use to add these on. We'll start by looking at one called geom point, and that will add points to the plot. But then later in this lecture and then in some of the other videos for this chapter, we'll look at some other geoms we can use as well. So we just covered these three elements, the data, the aesthetics, and the geoms. And these will be the three elements you'll almost always specify when you're using ggplot to create a visualization. By combining them in different ways, you'll have a lot of flexibility in creating a lot of different graphs. All right, so how do all of these go together now that we know the different pieces? Um, when you first look at some of the code, it looks like there's a lot going on. But now that you understand those pieces, we can really break down and look at where each piece is happening. This is generic code. This is just to show the usage of these calls. So if you put this in R, it's not going to run for you. But let's start by looking at the usage here, and then we'll show, I'll show an example with the Beijing uh, data set. So the first step that we'll use as we start out 
is to set which data we want to use. So we'll use a ggplot statement that'll create, that'll kind of initialize the ggplot object for us. And then we'll set that the data equals the name of our data frame. After we do that, we'll, we'll move on to adding on these different geoms. So here I'm using an example with a point geom. And so each one of those geoms has its own function. So we'll add on the function for the type of geom we want to add. And then inside that geoms function call, we will set up the mapping using that AES function. So we'll do mapping as our formal argument there. And then we'll use AES to set up those combinations of which aesthetics match, map to which column in the data frame. So this is uh, in this example, it's saying that the Position on the x-axis should map to the value in the column named column one, position on the y-axis to the column named column two, and so on. So let's look at the example of doing that for the, the kind of toy example I just mentioned. This is using the Beijing PM data set. Um, I've been using that in some of the previous lectures for this chapter. And so you might already have that set up, but if not, go back into some of your code for the previous lectures and be sure to add that. Then the one other piece that we'll need, we need to make sure that we have the ggplot2 uh, library loaded. So once you do that, um, we can create some of these objects. So I'll do ggplot. And then the data in this case I want to bring in is the Beijing PM data. So let's just remember what we have in that. And in this case, I have the columns that I added in the video about logical vectors beyond index and heating, but it's fine if you don't have those. We won't be using those in those examples. So if you only have these first four, that's fine. So the first four in this case are the sample time, and that's a date time object. Then the value, this is the PM 2.5 concentration measured at that specific time. A QC column that gives kind of a valid or invalid for whether the measurement taken at that time was valid, whether the equipment was working. And then AQI, and these this gives categories um, for based on the value in PM 2.5. All right, so our first step again is this ggplot. If you run just that, it will create a ggplot object. And something will pop up in your plot section, but it won't have anything in it yet. We haven't added any geoms. We haven't done any mappings to aesthetics or anything like that. So right now we have that object, but we're not really doing anything with it. And if you want to double check again, you can pipe this output into the class function and you'll see that we have it as this ggplot object. Once you have that object, you can start adding on the geoms. So I'll do a point geom. And in this case, for my mapping, I want to map the X position to sample time. And then the Y position to the value. And then the color to the AQI. All right, so now when we run that, we'll see it has created our scatter plot for us. Right now, we've got some of these values that were the negative 999. Those are ones that really should be missing. So we could change that if we wanted. Let's come back up to the Beijing PN and let's filter this so we only have the value, the, the observations where the value is higher than zero um, because there shouldn't be the chance for a negative value. So I think those are all cases where something was coded in. in in a way to kind of indicate a missing value for one reason or another. So if we run this, we can go down now and run our plot. And you'll see that now we just have these, these um, zero and higher values. You can look at this either in your plot window right here, or there's also the zoom, and that lets you see it in a bigger window. So again, in this case, we are mapping with this aesthetic so that the sample time is on the x-axis, the value is on the y-axis, and then AQI shown with color. We just used GM point, but there are a lot of these GM functions you can use to add elements to the plot. Uh, so geom point, we just use that creates a point in two dimensions. Geom line and geom path both connect observations with a line. 
GMAB line will allow you to add a line with a specified intercept, intercept and slope. So this can be really useful if you fit a line and you have the estimate of the intercept and the slope and you want to show that. Or maybe you're comparing two values that should be equal. Then you could include a line as a reference that's got an intercept of zero and a slope of one to do that comparison. You can add horizontal and vertical lines with GMH line and GMV line. You can add what's called a rug pot with GM rug. Uh, we're going to look at that in a second. And then you can add labels with GM label and GM text. This week, we won't be going really deeply into all of these types of GMs, but we'll do more and more as we go through the class, starting with the next chapter, where we'll talk a little bit more about how to create plots for, for communication and for publication, rather than just creating these initial plots to explore your data. So you can add these different GMs, just kind of string them along in a line. And we'll look at doing that. So we just added the GM point, but now let's add a GM line and a GM rug as well. I'll take out the color for right now so it's a little bit less busy. So if we looked without the color, you can see that we've still got the plot. It's taken out that color scale. That's why it's a little bit longer now or wider. Um, but it's showing the same thing with the points. So now we can add on a line and we'll add it with that same mapping. And then we could add on that rug pot too and I'll explain what that is in a minute. And again with the same mapping. So let's run that and then we can look at it. All right, so now we have our points just like we did before, but we've also got um, lines connecting all of them. So we can see this a little bit more as a time series now. And then we've got this rug element. Um, on the y-axis, I don't know if it's terribly helpful because that data is so kind of like densely, densely packed that it looks like a solid line. But you can see the point of this a little bit more on the y-axis. Each place that there is a point, it's going across and doing a line here. So this gives us in that dimension, in that y dimension, an idea of how the data is distributed. Just slicing in that dimension. So we can see that there are a few of these values that are up over uh, four or 500, but then really the majority of them are down in these lower values. The other thing to point out here, you might have noticed that our mapping in each case is exactly the same. So what we can do instead of repeating it each of these different times is we can actually put the mapping instead as part of our ggplot call. So I'll put it up here. I've used a comma to separate it from the data. And then once I do that, I can get rid of everything that is um, inside that call. We've moved all of that up here. So if I run that, I can clear right here. So we have a fresh a fresh plotting area. And then when I run that, you can see it's given the exact same thing. So what happens in this case is if we set some mapping up here in the ggplot call, those become the default mappings for each of the GMs that you add underneath. Now you could put some information as well inside the GM to kind of overwrite it for one particular GM, but the default will be for it to carry through. So this can save you some space in typing. If, if you find yourself adding a lot of elements that all have the same mappings. So this is a slide just on that note I just made. So if you wanna use it to kind of take notes or remember that point, you can. The other thing that I wanted to point out is that our first argument here is the data frame. So what that means is if we want, instead of specifying our data there, we can pipe it in. This is just like we've been doing for a lot of the ggplot stuff. Excuse me, for a lot of the tidyverse stuff. So here, this is saying the first argument of the ggplot call should be that Beijing PM value. So we can run that, and again, that works exactly the same way. This is just one other way to express that. Again, this is a slide. Um, providing the details of what we just covered in our studio. But if you want to have something to remember that point, I put it in this slide as well.